Well, of course, uh, we've got Steve Millington coming up in just a short while on the program. He is the chairman of the Twin Falls County Republican Party, and he joins us on Tuesday mornings, most Tuesday mornings. There was a Tuesday a couple of weeks ago where he was actually in sunny and warm San Diego when visiting the San Diego Zoo. Uh, a great many people probably dream about that with some of the weather we've had lately. Did you know, though, that this weekend we're going to, well, I wouldn't call it Indian summer, but it's going to be much uh, much nicer this uh, this coming Coming, uh, coming, uh, what you call uh, weekend? Well, if you're working on, of course, many medical professionals and some other folks too as well. Their weekends are in the middle of the week, so we brought that up before. We're not trying to make you feel bad about that. On the other hand, if it does make you feel bad, I guess you have to take a Valium. We're not doing the politically correct thing here and trying to avoid insulting everybody when we don't even know we're insulting them. We'll talk a little bit about that later in the program too, as well, because of what's going on on some college campuses across the country. But in the meantime, I wanted to share with you something I happened to come across. I go to great lengths to prepare this show, sometimes spending hours and hours and hours searching the globe to come up with some of these stories that we can relate to here in the Magic Valley. And this is one of those stories that I've come across. Young Conservatives is a website, and the name is a giveaway, isn't it? It's not published by young communists or even young Republicans, but by young conservatives. And the writer actually is referring to a piece he saw at Glenn Beck's The Blaze. School decides not to close for Islamic holiday. Muslim parents respond by saying, we're going to be the majority soon. Now, that doesn't say you're going to be forced to close it when we're the majority, but I think that there is an implied threat that happens to be part of all of this. In other words, once there are more of us than there are of you, we're going to call the shots, and we'll do whatever we please at that point. 808, Bill Colley with you this morning on Top Story. On News Radio 1310, KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. A writer by the name of Michael Cantrell says, Are you one of the few individuals in this country who doesn't believe Islam's main goal is to take over the world and force everyone to cater to their every whim, convert to the religion, or die? He says, Well, I've got a story for you. Apparently, a group of Muslim parents in New Jersey are royally ticked off at a local school board for deciding not to shut down in honor of an Islamic holiday. Now, they were interviewing several people after the meeting, and one man said his name was Omar Abalkiar. We feel alienated from the Board of Education. We feel alienated from this system. In other words, our feelings are hurt. Do something about it. And then this came out of the mouth of somebody else at the meeting. Some people had to be escorted from the meeting. They got a little too loud and a little too vulgar. But this is a quote that actually came from one of the Muslim parents. We're going to be the majority soon. So you know what that implies. Now, when we were having this discussion before that first group of refugees arrived here from Syria uh, in the last several weeks, I was at a meeting of a, a local chapter of that Act for America group, which is put together nationally by Brigitte Gabriel, who's been warning about the problems we're going to have with this. And while I was at that meeting, that must have been as long ago as May, someone at that meeting actually came up with a figure and said that the average household size and if you think about this, if some of these people have multiple wives, and I don't know how you're going to, if they show up here and they've already married all of these wives, I think they only have to list one technically, right? They can still have children with the others. That's how some families and polygamous relationships have gotten around some of the laws over the course of the last century, century and a half in this country. But if they're coming here and they're having children, some of these families, on average, I think the figure I heard was 8.1 children for Islamic family. Now, when you look at the birth rate across the Western world, the replacement levels all over Western and Southern Europe and all over North America, save for Mexico, all over North America, the replacement levels are ridiculously low. Plus, in the United States, we've already killed off 60 million babies in their mommy's wombs over the last 42 years, so those people aren't there any longer. But the average U.S. household, the replacement rate is, it, it, it might be around two, but it's not going to grow the population. And in Europe, it's less than that. In many countries in Europe, people are just having one child, and there's no forced policy on that. They've just made the decision to have one child. And so, therefore, they can't, they can't populate their lands anymore. On the other hand, if you have newcomers who are showing up in your communities, and on average, you know, uh, Joe and Jane are having only 1.5 children, and yet Muhammad and his wife are having 8.1 children, it doesn't take too long. You don't necessarily have to import people by the hundreds of thousands. It doesn't take too long, just a few generations before that cloud is there in any one particular community. 
Now, we keep being told this is not going to happen here, even though there is evidence it is happening in New Jersey, even though there is evidence it's happening in Dallas and Houston, even though there is evidence it's happening in Minneapolis. How much longer do we have to look at all of that evidence in the aggregate? It's building all over the country. It's certainly building in Europe and claim that this isn't going to happen here. One school board member in New Jersey, his name is Gerald Lyons, suggested there is a perfectly valid reason for having school on Thursday, telling residents that closing school with just six days' notice would cause undue hardship for 5,000 to 10,000 parents who might not have anywhere else to send their kids. So in other words, Muhammad and his family walked into this meeting in New Jersey and demanded the school be closed six days away for the, for the Muslim holiday. Well, unless you're going to get a big snowstorm, it's not going to happen. And I think the board member made a great point. This was not about being anti-Muslim, but you know what's going to happen. You had television stations rush in to do all sorts of interviews and newspapers, and the portrayal is that this school board, probably those evil Christians who comprise it, this school board is being mean to the newcomers. And here's the board member, and you had to go to the blaze, and you had to go to Young Conservative to actually read that detail, because the TV stations apparently in New York City that covered this story did not go into any depth about why the board decided against this, other than to give the impression, well, they're just big meanies, bigots, racists, and they're treating Muslims bad or badly. 813, Bill Colley with you on Top Story. And we've heard it all here. Uh, we have seen it just go on for months and months and months. All opposition has been portrayed as somehow being just nothing but a bunch of knuckle-dragging racists who are just out to do bad things to other people who don't look like us or worship like us or talk like us, and we've had to deal with that. And the left just continues to bury its head in the sand. Its collective head goes into the sand and ignores everything else around it. You can reach our program today if you're inclined, 736-0300. That's 736-0300. Also, my email address is bill.colley at townsquaremedia.com, bill.colley at townsquaremedia.com. I'll share something with you quickly. I, I generally turn down my cell phone when I come into the studio. I bring it along, though, just for a little backup on uh, Internet and the like, that being one of those smartphones. I don't know how smart or intelligent it actually happens to be. But I bring this thing in, and I sit down, and I, I have it here. I've turned it down since 7 o'clock this morning, I, an hour early, because yesterday I went to a website. I need to have some household goods shipped from the East Coast to Idaho, and I need to have it done in the next few weeks. So I went to this website. And I filled out all the details, but you had to put down your phone number. And I got a call within 10 minutes, and the guy says, oh, you're going to be getting a lot of calls. So a lot of people out there who move goods across the country are just calling me left and right, even after I went to bed last night. It was very pleasant. But I've turned the phone down to ensure that we're not going to get a lot of those exterior interruptions during the course of the program today. 815-35, Bill Colley with you on Top Story on News Radio 1310 KLIX and NewsRadio1310.com. And you're next. You're on the air. Yes, I recently uh, noticed that China has relaxed its one-child policy. And uh, I don't know if this has any connection at all, but to see it, what ultimately it, it does mean, though, is that everybody but whites are reproducing at a faster rate. And, uh, you know, it is what it is, man. The other day I was driving someplace and I walked into a dry, uh, you know, a restaurant and uh, it was full of Hispanics and they were nice guys. They were workers. They were doing something. No reason to have a problem with them, but none of them spoke English. So you always wonder, you know, how legal they were. And so, but what are you going to do? Yell, scream, say, hey, you can't be there. You know, what are you going to do? You're not going to do anything. But you see, I said to myself, they're here, and unless something changes, they're going to have to learn to be, love America somehow. I don't know how we're going to make them want to love America and be Americans, but it's a, it's a hell of a dilemma. I, I would agree, and I thank you much for the call. There is one way I think that you can determine whether they're here legally or not. Get yourself a windbreaker and then have someone go to a screening shop and have them print INS on the back. 
You'd be amazed how quickly a restaurant might clear out in that situation. I have this today as well. Ayan Hersi Ali. Now, if you don't know her name, uh, this is a woman who came out of East Africa. Uh, she was mutilated as part of uh, the Muslim faith by uh, her tribe and uh, you know, kept essentially in bondage as a woman. But she was very intelligent, very bright, managed to get away, lived in Holland for a while where she was threatened with death at every corner by a great many of the, the, the Islamic hordes that have moved into that part of Western Europe. Now she's living in the United States. There's there fatwas all over the world. That means death sentences pronounced against her, speaking of knuckle-dragging idiots, by some of the people who actually claim to be representatives of the Islamic faith. She was writing, and I believe this is a Time magazine, and excuse me, Foreign Policy is the actual publication. And the headline is, she's very blunt about it, Islam is a religion of violence. In the 14 years, she says, since the attacks of 9-11 brought Islamic terrorism to the forefront of American and Western awareness, and then President George W. Bush launched the global war on terror. How long did that last, right? The violent strain of Islam appears to have metastasized. And uh, she's got some details about this. So she goes into all of the domestic attacks we've seen, which if you list them, then you start to actually get to. And she didn't even mention the one at Merced College or the college in Merced, California last week, probably because she was writing this before all of the details of, of that story broke. But she has a long, lengthy list here. It's a very long piece that she has in this publication. She says, I believe that we can distinguish three different groups of Muslims in the world today based on how they envision and practice their faith. Number one, the fundamentalists. These are the extremists. They are practicing their seventh century faith. Number two, she says, there's a great big group of Muslims in the middle who are a lot like us, who just go about their daily business, want to watch a good ball game now and then, soccer, I guess, in their part of the world generally, want to watch a good, uh, in fact, in some parts of the world, cricket. They, they love the sport. I don't know why, but <laughs> you know, it was imported from the British Empire. And, and they go about their business, and they leave everyone alone. And then she said there's a third group, and these are people called the Reformers. And they would like to try to bring the faith into the modern world. They would like to bring it out of the 7th century. So there's a battle between the fundamentalists and the Reformers for that great middle of the Islamic world. She has concluded, unfortunately, that the middle is being attracted to the fundamentalists, that is, the Islamic terrorists, the Islamo-fascists who are committing all of the heinous crimes around the world in all sorts of various places, simply because they give the impression that they are standing up for the oppressed around the world. At least that's the, that's the impression they get in these countries, where the reformers, they're just looked at as being eggheads. No one really wants to listen to them. And in her view, and I, I published, or I, pro, I printed this, she published it, I printed this, today, and I was just amazed. I read through the whole thing. It's about nine pages long after I printed it out. But she was a woman who lived it. I don't know why we would in any way doubt what she has to say. Uh, but on the other hand, you have to deal with your local newspaper editors who would like to obviously join that collective group, stick their heads in the sand, and pretend it doesn't exist. Bill Colley with you on Top Story. I've got more coming up on a, a similar topic in just a moment. College campuses ready to explode in this country. So I wanted to share something, uh, some thoughts about these college campuses. It's not just one, but there are several around the country right now where the students have taken over the campuses. And it's a bit like, uh, I guess, what is it, Lord of the Flies? Is that the, the story about where the kids take over and things get completely out of control? We've got that situation going on now across the country. Academia created it, and academia doesn't know what to do about it now. 823, Bill Colley with you on Top Story on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. 34. It feels pretty nice outside, though. No strong winds and gusts like we were experiencing about midday yesterday. I do want to remind people, I've been saying this for the last couple of months on the air, if you're listening to this program, it's likely because you think it's important. You want to keep listening to it. If you'd like to uh, keep listening to it, you need to have your hearing checked every once in a while. And we've been recommending Dr. Christine Pickup. She's in Rupert. She's a doctor of audiology, Mount Harrison Audiology. And, in fact, because if you're familiar with that name, you can go online to mountharrisonaudiology.com and check out her website. Telephone number at her office is 208-312-0957, 1218-9th Street, unit number 2 in Rupert. Hearing loss and dementia are linked. A lot of people don't know that, but hearing loss becomes a great burden on the brain as you have to spend more time and energy attempting to decipher what others are saying to you. Treating hearing loss reduces the strain and makes hearing more natural. 
keep your brain healthy by taking care of your hearing. The story that got a lot of attention yesterday on some of the national talk shows happens to be what was going on at the University of Missouri, where the football team said it wouldn't play this coming weekend if the, well, they got the the head now of a couple of different administrators. The college president has quit, but also one of his assistants as well. They're now out of the picture, and the students are demanding, essentially, that the college, the people who run the college, admit that is do a mea culpa because white privilege exists, according to these students. I don't know if you saw what happened afterwards. There was a big celebration by the students when they learned that the college president had forfeited his job and walked away in the hopes of keeping things a little peaceful on campus. That was because one student was on a hunger strike with no, again, no serious demands, nothing really concrete other than, you know, white privilege is a bad thing and you better admit it or else. I'll starve myself, (laughs) you know. I don't know. Maybe you give them a couple of weeks, and then you go by, and you walk by eating an ice cream cone or something, or go go stand about 15 feet away and cook a nice juicy steak and see what his reaction is. You couldn't get that close, though, because if you saw some of the coverage from yesterday, media decided they were going to go down and commune with their fellow travelers among these students. The students tried to beat them up. In fact, a couple of the photographers were actually assaulted, and one of the people taking part was a media professor from the campus. What example is she setting for her students? Oh, you got to be a good hard-nosed reporter. But first, I'm going to go out on the quad, and I'm going to smack a couple of hard-nosed reporters on the nose. You know what news media is going to do. It's going to buckle on this one because they're going to look across that quad and see all those students who've been beating them up, and they're going to say, well, they had to. They're victims, of course. And me, I'm a white reporter, and I'm privileged, so therefore I needed to be beaten up. Also, it's going on at Yale University. That's in Connecticut, part of the Ivy League. There's a couple of things I came across about that this morning. Wall Street Journal calls the students Yale's little Robespierre's. Now, I don't know that the students, unless they're history majors, would understand that. Robespierre was the guy who, when the French Revolution occurred, claimed that he was against the death penalty. And then when he discovered there were enemies of his revolution wherever he looked, he hauled out the guillotine and started chopping off heads by the tens of thousands. And he slaughtered over 100,000 Christians as well during the course of his reign of terror before someone finally got wise. It could happen here. These are the same types of seeds that are being planted. Why are they doing this at Yale? Because administrators sent out a list saying these are acceptable Halloween costumes and these are unacceptable Halloween costumes. Nothing about actually learning anything, but, you know, this is what you should wear on Halloween and this is what you shouldn't wear. A couple of professors came forward and said this is ridiculous. If you don't like what someone's wearing, turn your head and look the other way. Now the students are demanding that those professors apologize and or be fired. Why? Because they said, look the other way. And the students are saying they're harming the safe space of the university. Someday, someday these kids are going to go out into the working world, maybe. And when they do, they're going to discover things aren't quite like college happened to be. I was sitting around the last couple of days wondering exactly what you could do to try to bring them to their senses. Things could get very ugly before it all comes to an end. Yeah, there there have been problems on college campuses before. Sometimes they were settled with a little bit of uh, conclusive violence. Some of the old timers may remember this song, uh, Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young. People always say, you know, Kent State shocked the country. No, it didn't. I grew up in a blue-collar home. I used to sit around and listen to my dad and his buddies while they were playing cards. Those four kids got blown away there. What do you think all of these guys thought as they were sitting around? My dad had a George Wallace bumper sticker on his car for crying out loud. How do you think he felt about that? The truth is, 90% of America said, well, maybe this will finally quiet them down. And I'll tell you what, they're cruising for a bruising if they're going to keep this stuff up because at some point, when they try to take over the campuses completely, it's not going to work. This is how, and we keep hearing that Democrats are going to be in a permanent majority, even though during the reign of Obama, Republicans have been sweeping offices at the local level, county level, and state level since he actually was elected president. By and The numbers are just astounding. The Democrat Party has almost vanished on the local level. Uh, Obviously, here in Twin Falls, I remember walking by party headquarters one day, and the building was uh, for lease. It should tell you a little something about that. 29 minutes after 8 o'clock, we're going to get a little political talk in, in fact, with Steve Millington in just a few minutes. He's the chairman of the Twin Falls 
County Republican Party, and we'll share some thoughts on that. But they keep saying the, that the, the Republican Party is a dying party, dying people. They said that all the way back. In, if you ever read a book called Nixon Land, great book. I, I checked it out of the library a couple of years ago and read it. And it says that when all of this was going on in the 1960s, and then Ronald Reagan came along, and he was running for governor of California, and he said, you know what? I'm going to put a stop to it. I'm going to put a boot in somebody's backside. And he ended up defeating a candidate they said couldn't be defeated. And two years later, Richard Nixon took the same message and got elected president. So lefty's got a lot of dreaming going on right now, but if things get really out of hand, the majority of Americans, God-fearing, hard-working Americans, will be looking for someone to put things back together. It's 830 and 35.